Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, this webinar is the start of an Engineering New Zealand initiative in partnership with our technical groups to highlight the lessons to be learnt from engineering failures where human factors have played a role. And this is really about learning from those mistakes and not placing blame. So we're really excited uh, to be kicking this off with Gordon Hughes and Glenn Corey today, and they've both been instrumental in bringing this initiative to life. They'll be talking about types of failure, the importance of learning from them, and causes. And we'll continue with the initiative in the new year with a number of webinars and case studies from our technical groups on a monthly basis. And the case studies will also be available to view on our website in due course. If you'd like to know more about the range of technical groups under the Engineering New Zealand umbrella, we'll pop a link down in the Q&A box below. So please feel free to ask some questions throughout the presentation today, and Gordon and Glenn will get to those at the end. I'll now pass over to Gordon and Glenn to get started. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Glenn Curry. Uh, I'm going to start off this presentation. It's going to be a bit of a tag team this afternoon. Uh, it's really good to see some pretty impressive numbers uh, still joining us as well. It's good to see the interest in this. Um, I'll let uh, Gordon explain sort of his backstory as to how he came into this uh, later on. But I suppose um, from my perspective, I, uh, I used to work at the University of Canterbury uh, teaching there and uh, about seven years ago I uh, was teaching a final year course in professional engineering development and one of the things I got quite interested in was this area of engineering failures and, and how we didn't actually spend a lot of time uh, really looking into what happens when things go wrong and what we can learn from it. So I, I developed a bit of material at the time. Some of you may have been former students of mine and, and remember some of that. And it was certainly something that um, stuck with me as, as thinking this is something we should do a lot more of in the industry, making people understand uh, the, uh, the lessons that can be learned uh, from as much the things that go wrong as well as all the things that we, we celebrate go right as well. Uh, so this is very much an introductory uh, presentation. We're, we're hoping it will be the start of a series of presentations uh, and webinars from different technical groups to uh, get down into some of the detail uh, of specific disciplines as well. Uh, and I'll apologise in advance that bits of it are probably a bit wordy as well. Unfortunately, we've, we've pulled this together a bit last minute and um, you may just have to bear with uh, some of the wall of words and places. So uh, here's what we're going to go through today. I'm, I'm going to start off with just sort of talking about what we actually mean by failure. There's actually quite a few different uh, ways we can sort of define it uh, and look at some examples there. Uh, and then I'm going to hand over to Gordon who's going to start looking to the question of why we'd investigate failures and introduce you to the Swiss cheese model uh, of failure as well. Uh, and some examples of where we perhaps haven't learnt our lessons from the past as well. Uh, then I'm going to talk a bit about human error and how that also manifests in bigger groups and organisations as well. And then Gordon is going to wrap up at the end as to where do we go from here, what's, what's next, and, and then we'll have the opportunity to look at some of those questions that you uh, have or any other discussion. So uh, we are very focused on uh, doing things well as engineers. We want to um, make sure we have successful projects. We don't like to see failures in our own work, um, but you know we sometimes can't, can't help uh, but have things that don't quite go well. Uh, and, and indeed some of us end up working on projects where we're actually trying to fix other people's failures uh, as well in some, some ways. Uh, and, and a lot of you would have gone through university and learnt, uh, if you like, the successful recipes for how you do do things, how you build various things successfully and good design practice and so forth. Um, but perhaps uh, not a lot of you necessarily looked at the questions of, well, how do we know when things could go wrong? Or if they have gone wrong, what do we learn from those? Uh, aspects, and so that's what we want to start thinking about uh, in this session today. Uh, there's there's a myriad of reasons why things can go wrong, and we'll, we'll go into more detail later on. But just as a starting point, for example, here's some of the reasons why you may um, find things don't go too well. Uh, we can certainly relate with the last one. We, we've been rushing, and just even today, to just try and get this presentation finalised, and a couple of things tweaked, and, and and that meant an error even in sending through the wrong PowerPoint, and you know all sorts of fun like that. But um, yeah, they often are issues of quality control. Um, sometimes there are things in terms of you just don't have sufficient resources, whether that's time or uh, fees. Uh, there may be systemic reasons why you keep making the same mistake. Uh, there may be cultural reasons why we uh, don't see things, we're blind to things that are wrong. Uh, and we've got to be always mindful of uh, the role of peer review and other checking processes as well. 
to make sure that um, those are part of trying to make sure things do get uh, picked up if, if they could go wrong otherwise. So uh, what do we mean by failure? Uh, there's, there's probably quite a few different definitions, but here's at least four uh, that we could mean. Now we often think of the, um, the very dramatic failures, you know, bridge collapses and things like that, but failures can often be uh, a lot simpler things as well. It could just be that you had certain project objectives and you didn't meet them. Uh, in, in my field in transportation engineering, for example, there's often a lot of focus on toll roads and toll bridges, and you may have had a set plan for how much uh, money they were going to um, earn, and if you don't get sufficient traffic, you're not going to meet those targets. So that's a failure on that account. Uh, it may be that there's side effects that uh, you, you didn't expect to see as well. So maybe the original project objectives were fine, um, but there was things, perhaps effects on the environment or the community or so forth uh, that haven't been so good as well. Sometimes it's a question of whether we're actually asking the right question. Uh, maybe the objectives we're looking at are aimed at something else. And we've probably learnt, uh, particularly from the uh, Christchurch earthquakes, um, that the building code uh, is generally focused on trying to save lives. And it, it, you know, with a few notable exceptions, obviously, it did that reasonably well for most of the buildings around Christchurch. What it didn't do so well was necessarily save the buildings uh, and you, we had to go and demolish a whole lot and, and restart again. And uh, there was definitely some questions that have been asked about that as to uh, whether that's the right objective. Is that a success or a failure? Uh, and we've got to acknowledge that sometimes we actually deliberately design in failures as well. Things set up so that they will uh, break. Uh, for example, shrink sorry, shrinkage joints uh, in slabs so that they will break in the places that we want to, not the places that we don't want them to. Um, so there's a few different ways that we could have failures. And they can lead to all sorts of outcomes. Uh, they can be quite horrible outcomes like loss of life. Again, coming back to Christchurch earthquakes, uh, you know, 185 people dead. And so that is a serious thing that we, we have to consider. Uh, it's interesting, we pay a lot of attention to big events that have a large number of uh, deaths and, and injuries in one go, like uh, the earthquakes. Uh, again, if I think of my own sector in transportation, we routinely kill over 300 people a year in road crashes. Uh, but because it's often one or two at a time, perhaps it doesn't get same, the same attention as, as some of these more notable uh, one-off failures as well. And that's probably something we've got to ask a question about. There may be sort of more material losses that we have instead, uh, loss of property. Here you can see some landslip issues that were in Wellington, but you can think of other things, storms, flooding. We've had a couple of quite notable fires uh, in the last year as well. Uh, so those things there can all, all be failures as well and, and losses. It could be other things that we're used to in terms of normal levels of service. Uh, we're used to, for example, fresh, clean drinking water. And so it's always a, a bit of a shock to the system when suddenly something goes wrong and we can't do that. And we have to boil our water or, or get it from a, a, a separate tank or something like that. Uh, because it, that's not what we're used to, certainly in a developed country as well. So we've got to understand why this happens and how we can try and prevent it. And there's a myriad of other things that could be losses as well. Um, there could be just your loss of time. Uh, in transport, that happens all the time. You're held up in traffic because there was a crash or some other incident, and so you don't get to work on time. And uh, there's various other ways that we can think of things that didn't go so well, and, and we paid some penalty uh, for them. We could be looking at failures uh, right across the range of projects as well. I guess we... Um, are, focus a lot on the ones once something's built and it's operating, they're often a lot more obvious. Um, but it's important to recognise the potential for failures early on as well. It may be that we, we make mistakes in our design process, for example. Or it may be that uh, in those earlier stages when we are looking at feasibility and design, uh, we can see the potential for something to go wrong. And so that's usually a much better time to spot that problem than obviously when it's been built and it's going to cost us a lot more money to fix uh, later on. Okay, projects often have more than one failure as well. Sometimes you have cascading failures. One problem leads to another problem, leads to another problem. And uh, so that can be a, a real issue there. And uh, we've got to be mindful that uh, we'll have different perspectives as well. So what might work well for one group may not be for another. We, we might create a, a waste treatment plant that for most people in the city is working really well. It's treating their waste. But maybe for the, the neighbours, they're not very happy because it's too noisy for them. Uh, so can we get a win-win where everyone is happy and we don't have some successes and failures as well. 
If we think of a lot of what engineers do, we, we cover a range of infrastructure options uh, here. Now obviously I, I'm a civil engineer so I'm somewhat biased in that space, but if we think of any of the engineering disciplines, uh, there are various things that you're often working on and developing. And if we take something like say, a standard greenfields development, um, there's a lot of bits to that puzzle. Um, there's new buildings, there's new roads and paths, there's various pipes that need to supply things, um, electrical power, and, and there's a whole bunch of things that could go wrong, basically. That is, that is the question. What could go wrong? And if you're planning this development, uh, you've got to be thinking through uh, what are those possibilities and, and trying to um, prevent any of them from causing a problem. It might be that, I mean, I've listed eight things there. It might be that seven of them you've got perfectly fine and they're, they're working really well. And it's just that one that you've got some, some real problems with. And that could be the reason why no one wants to go and live there. Um, because that's the thing that's causing them problems. So that could be the, the, the breaking point. Just some examples of, of things for a development like that. There could be things that happen during construction, um, which could be loss of life uh, if, you, if you don't do that well, but they could just be project management issues as well. Uh, the classics of uh, over time, over budget, uh, issues with the site uh, and quality and contamination and so forth. And then you've also got uh, issues with uh, things once the site is up and running as well, whether you've got operating issues about insufficient capacity, for example, or not getting the demand that you expected to have for certain facilities as well. So you can kind of understand why someone who is perhaps developing uh, a new subdivision really has to um, you know, work their way through what are the things that could go wrong. There is a bit of a, a gamble here, and, and that's why the banks have to look at that as well. Now I'm going to hand over to my colleague Gordon, who's now going to look at some of the questions of, of why these things happen and how we investigate them. I need to unmute. There you go, Gordon. I first got interested in this um, uh, learning from structural mistakes, um, a short presentation I gave at the CSOP conference in 2018 and then followed by a series of talks. And it seems that uh, people are interested in that. Um, I was very mindful on the, um, the second slide, uh, there was a picture of the Fayo Canal disaster. And by an accident of fate, the engineer responsible, that could well have been me because um, it was my successor uh, in the Rotorua office of the consulting firm that um, I worked for that designed that. Uh, I'd left uh, a year or so earlier to do some work in local government. So uh, sometimes an accident of, of timing can either put you in that position uh, or, or avoid it. So we're looking at the Swiss cheese model, and most of you are aware of a Swiss cheese with a whole bunch of randomly placed holes. Uh, and the model that um, Professor Reason has developed, the idea is that there are various slices of these pieces of cheese um, that you can task for particular actions uh, as, as in the model on the screen. And then when all the holes lined up, you'll get an accident or an incident. And you've got two types of um, events there. You've got your latent failures, uh, that just lie dormant, or an active is the one, of course, that uh, occurs at the time of failure. So why do we want to investigate failures? I guess the main reasons, of course, are so we can remove them, mitigate, or at least know how we're going to respond to them in the future. Often there are some quite consistent systemic reasons why things fail, and of course humans are the, the common element. In fact, I've read some information that indicates that even in the design phase, about 60% of um, mistakes are, are caused by humans, and, and I think a similar proportion in the construction phase. So really, uh, the, the biggest problem is human. To investigate failure, figure out what went wrong, how and why, um, there also is societies wish to blame and punish 
people, and, and we hear that all the time, uh, just on the radio today, about people, about as far as the Afari White Islanders. They want to have people to blame. Sometimes I wonder whether that's a good thing, but that's a societal issue. Of course, the other big reason to investigate failure is to identify how we can avoid that in the future. This is a quick definition, definition of a mistake. Here is an indicator of one's knowledge. The learning takes place where a mistake is identified, its producers are identified, and it is corrected. The learning from failures, as Glenn's already said, um, in the standard teaching mode, we tend to learn from things that have gone well. A natural fact is research that indicates we learn better and have a better understanding of things if we actually learn from mistakes and failures. And then that often leads to an update of design standards and codes. But they can take a long time, and that can lose momentum and public support. It's of a hiatus of any preventable action. Now, for example, CSOC um, issued interim design guides following the Christchurch earthquakes because CSOC knew it was going to take a time, quite a long time as it turned out, before the standards and design codes were modified. And sometimes, of course, there may not be any mandatory requirement to take action from inquiry recommendations. And again, the Royal Commission on Canterbury Earthquakes comes to mind. Not all of their recommendations have been implemented. Question, the memory of failure fade with time. I think it does, and I, Henry Pososky in his Success Free Failures publication in 2006 uh, illustrates this with a apparent sequence of bridge failures, uh, which repeat itself at about 30 year intervals. You can see that in the next slide. Um, but what seems to happen is you design something, they work, push the limits a bit more, they're still okay, and you push the limits too far or you lack understanding. Uh, then something goes wrong. But as I just mentioned, the last slide, that interval is about 30 years. And you think about that, that's the time for one generation of engineers to move on, the new cohort to lead the way. For example, most of the new engineers entering the engineering profession won't know of a lot of the stuff the Ministry of Works used to produce in the 1970s and the 1980s. Uh, again, that's sort of one example of that institutional memory loss. There's a couple of illustrations. This will never happen again. Hartford Civic Centre in 1978. Over 30 years later, the South Fim Stadium. So there's a pattern of failure. Looking at the bridge examples, 1847, the bridge, which was a truss girder. 1879, a bridge, which was a truss. 1907, Quebec cantilever bridge. 1940, Human Narrows, and there's a good illustration of that failure you can find on the web. Westgate Bridge in um, Australia. Millennium Footbridge, uh, just uh, 10, 20 years ago. And who's to guess the next 31, maybe in about 10 years' time? And the guesstimate is going to be a cable stay or some new technology, concrete box girder. Oops. Is this the next one yours, is it then? Okay, so critical success factors in projects. The key requirement is to have your project goals clearly defined. Your resources are enough. And one of the things that I've seen in the reviews of structural problems and mistakes is there seems to be a climb to the bottom in terms of fees, people chasing work and uh, not even getting fees that are adequate uh, to cover the minimum effort. Uh, the other is to have control mechanisms in place and used. Because this is extensively used in the aviation industry, pilots have their check checklists and uh, positive responses. Again, that's part of the control quality control uh, situation that we can use in, in engineering. 
Of course, the project has to have the support of uh, management. And one of the regular ones is communication. That these are adequate, clear, and adequate uh, for all the people, not just the top people, but right through the whole process, uh, right down to the people that are working on the projects. Number of occasions I've read where laborers on the bridge, for example, I'm saying reporting stuff, things are making noises, uh, they are ignored. And then, of course, something goes wrong, sometimes catastrophic, because that communication channel is not open, clear, and accessible to all. And the critical success factors and projects got to be a capability for feedback, we just mentioned. Contractors have to be responsive to clients. And of course, project managers got to be competent, and that's an area that I've seen that uh, project managers may have management skills, but they lack knowledge of the particular processes, and uh, often uh, that can lead to problems. I think that is one of the weaknesses in the last 20 years or so in New Zealand is a tendency for project managers, but not all of them are competent. And the team itself, obviously, implementing the uh, project uh, has to be competent. Now, is this your time, Glenn? Yep, that would be me. Okay. Oops, let's get back one. There we go. Uh, okay, I want to spend a little bit of time just focusing on this issue of human error because it's, it's quite a big one. Um, as engineers, I guess we often focus a lot on effectively inanimate objects. You know, we work with things like steel and soil and water and so forth. And uh, we've sort of got to recognise the human element in terms of both who's helping to create those things, but then who's also ultimately using uh, those things as well. Uh, I guess in my case, coming from a transportation background, I'm a bit more focused on that because obviously there's lots of those pesky humans in the transportation system trying to drive around and all the other things they do not terribly well. Uh, but it's something really um, we've got to be mindful of in the whole process. And uh, when I, uh, I used to have students looking into various uh, historical failures and trying to understand what went wrong, um, perhaps not surprisingly, they'd often focus uh, firstly on the technical reasons why something went wrong. You know, ah, beam A broke, and then that caused column C to collapse, and da 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 da. Uh, but the trick was to step back from that and understand, yes, but how did we get to that point? What caused that final ultimate failure? And, and invariably, that's when you found the human factors coming through. That was when you found that someone had taken a bit of a shortcut somewhere. There'd been a communication misunderstanding, um, all sorts of things like this that are sometimes it's just a genuine human error coming through. So let's let's just have a think uh, about this for a, a few slides here. So when we think of of errors, uh, they can happen at various stages. It it could be that something preceding the the actual failure was the thing that caused it. Someone made a call earlier on and that ultimately led to your problem that you're seeing. It could be that uh, it was something in the actual process that you had to do. So you had to construct something or you had to operate something and you had certain actions to take and they didn't quite go as planned. Something went wrong along the way there. Um, or it could be at the end as well, you just, you think everything's gone right and yet you operate it and suddenly, oh, I didn't expect that. Or something comes up, you just hadn't allowed for it as well. So all these stages have the possibility for humans to do something wrong and uh, not realize perhaps what they've done until perhaps it's too late as well. Uh, Gordon mentioned James Reason before. Professor Reason very much focused in this space, introduced us to the Swiss cheese model and really has done a lot of work in this human error side of things, the psychology of uh, how we get things wrong or why we get things wrong and definitely worth looking at some of his readings to understand this a bit better. When we look at human error, uh, there's sort of three different ways we can break down the type of errors that we um, have, and we'll go into a bit more detail, but basically they boil down to what we call skill-based errors, so that's sort of the basic things that you just um, do often without even thinking actually, just over time, you know, you learn to ride a bicycle, you don't then afterwards think how to ride the bicycle, you just, you've just learned the skill, so they become subconscious. Uh, then there's sort of rule-based errors, and that's where you have certain rules and heuristics that you get to know. You get taught, okay, if this happens, then do this. If this happens, then do this. And uh, so hopefully you, you learn to pick the right 
processes and rules. And, and problems can, can, of course, occur if you take the wrong decision or you, you're not aware of a rule that you should have applied. And then the even trickier ones, especially in engineering, are what we call the knowledge base errors. This is where you don't have something you can get straight out of the manual. Uh, and of course, we deal with that a lot of the time. We don't have standard things. We're trying to solve a, a problem for a client that's completely new. And we're having to sort of go back from basic principles to work out, well, how are we going to solve this? Um, and so likewise, if, if something's happening and we've never come across it before, we have to step back and try and understand, right, what way do we go forward from here? What do we know? What don't we know? And it's sometimes a case of coming up with a plan, give it a try, see if it works um, or appears to work. If it does, that's great. If not, let's try again, try a different plan. Um, and you, you're relying on your knowledge, you're relying on your experience to um, you work your way through those kind of ones. So the first one's the skill-based errors, and, and they're what um, the uh, psychologists psychologist would call action slips or lapses. Okay, they're just common mistakes that we just make all the time. Um, sometimes because we weren't paying attention, sometimes because we were paying too much attention on one thing and not on other things around us as well. Uh, these are sort of the, some of the standard definitions of things uh, where we do get things wrong. Uh, sometimes it's old habits are hard to break and we end up doing them on something new when we shouldn't have done. Um, the classic I find is I've switched cars and so now I've got to remember that I change indicators with the left hand switch, not the right hand switch, you know, things like that. Uh, and there's all sorts of these ones that are just the frailties of human beings that we, uh, we muck things up, we get things mixed up. Uh, some four, a few more there as well. We might just forget to do something. Uh, we might uh, do something we've already done. So there's all sorts of things. Um, the advantage of most of these things is that usually we're pretty quick to identify them because usually there's some kind of response uh, that we see, some kind of reaction. We go, oh, hang on, that's not what was meant to happen. And you realize what you did and uh, you, you can then very quickly rectify it, hopefully before there's a problem. So that sort of skill-based there is there, and uh, as I say, they're usually fairly immediate, the things that happen as you go, whether it's you're doing a design calculation and you sort of put some numbers down and you look again and think, hang on, no, I've, I've carried the one wrong or whatever, and, and you've done the calculation wrong. Um, or it's something when you're operating machinery and you push the wrong button and then realize it because something made a funny noise and, and you realize, oh no, I should have done that one. So rule-based errors are, are more what we call mistakes, where you're applying rules, but you're applying them wrongly. Okay, There may be a rule that you've said, well, I always use this rule, but it's actually the wrong rule. And it's just you don't have the experience. You don't have knowledge of other rules that you should have applied for that situation. Uh, it may be that uh, you started off with a certain approach. You assumed, right, it's this situation, and you're applying the rules based around that. And later on, things are suggesting, well, maybe it's not. But you kind of already have this world view of, no, I think I'm on the right track. And so you, if anything, you're trying to explain why those other counterindicators aren't true, uh, rather than saying, well, maybe they're telling me something as well. A, a real classic one with complex situations, and engineering is a lot of that, is just having too much information. Um, and that might mean you, you don't notice the crucial bit of information, you, you're too focused on something else. Or you don't actually know what is the crucial information. You don't have enough experience to know that one's important. That one doesn't really matter if we get that one wrong. Okay. Most of these things here are really about training and experience. Um, so certainly, as you've learnt in your um, tertiary training, and then as you move on to your on-the-job training as well, you, you typically get better at a lot of these things. Okay. You don't make the same silly mistakes, hopefully, over time because you learn to know what works, and it almost becomes second habit. Uh, you can very quickly understand the situation. The third one is the knowledge base errors. And uh, when we look at major failures, it's usually these kinds of situations uh, that contribute to it because they're often quite complex systems and we haven't seen all the pieces of the puzzle and we've really had to rely on our knowledge and indeed the collective knowledge often of a team to understand uh, what's going on. So there's a few... Uh, list of items there about things that may cause us to get things wrong. Okay, We focus on the wrong thing, the wrong information, the wrong model. Um, we don't see some information, so we, we don't sort of consider it. Confirmation bias is a classic one because we don't like to admit that we're wrong once we've made a call on something. Uh, likewise, overconfidence can be a problem too, that uh, we think, yep, no, I, I definitely know this, uh, and, and perhaps don't listen to people questioning whether you've actually got it right. 
Uh, as someone who's in a regular pub quiz every Tuesday night, I have to learn this one because we have these discussions amongst the team. Have you got the right answer? Yeah, yeah, no, I definitely know that answer. Uh, and uh, not always that's, that's the case. Uh, yeah, we as humans, we have lots of built-in biases, and that is the problem. That can blind us to where we should actually be checking or questioning ourselves a bit more. Uh, and it can be all sorts of uh, illusions that contribute to that, things that seem like a cause and effect but actually aren't, uh, and other things that we just oversimplify if A then B, but actually we forgot about step C as well. Okay, And yeah, they're complex issues to... Uh, fix at the time and certainly to even diagnose later on. Some of these major uh, inquiries of, of investigation, uh, trying to understand, like the Christchurch earthquakes, there's a lot of complexity there to understand all the pieces of the puzzle and what led to it. It takes time. Uh, that is why some of these inquiries do take years, because there are a lot of pieces to work out uh, going through. So how do we reduce these errors, or at least the effects of them? Um, as much as possible, we want to come up with ways that we can make it easier to identify them as we're going through and, and get rid of them from there. So as I say, the first type, the slips, they're the easiest ones, um, usually because they're, they're obvious straight away. Usually you recognize them. It's, you don't even need someone else to point out the problems of it. The other thing, I guess, is, is we need to identify things that seem a bit strange or unusual. If there's a success, or it seems like a success, but something's a bit unusual, it's perhaps more successful than normal or... Uh, something like that, we perhaps want to just have a check on that and see if there's uh, something going on as well. The other problem we can have is that, uh, and you saw the diagram of the Swiss cheese model, we have what we call active and latent errors. And uh, the active ones are the ones that ultimately cause the problem, but it may be because there was a few latent ones hiding there as well uh, that we hadn't even noticed. Uh, they just sort of sat there and they were fine, perfectly fine until someone did anything about them. Um, if you think of something like asbestos in buildings, for example, and people get very worried about that, and yes, if you expose it, it's a real issue. If you keep it contained, uh, it's generally okay until you expose it. And so if you like, it's almost like a latent error, in, in effect. It's until you, you have something else that causes it, like you accidentally punch a hole in the ceiling, uh, it's um, potentially okay, but it's still there as a latent risk. Uh, as much as possible, if you can get a fresh pair of eyes, this is where audit and review processes are really important, that you're getting someone else to understand and walk through what you did uh, to try and see whether they can see yep, the process or, or the thing you can't see, the, the reason why something's not working and you're too focused to it, you can't see the wood for the trees, maybe someone else further removed can actually look and go, ah, oh, no, I see your problem right there. So ultimately, it's all about some kind of feedback mechanism. Uh, and you've got to work out what that means for your industry, whether it's um, a, a personal feedback mechanism, some kind of automated feedback ne mechanism, physical one. Um, but you've got to look for something that then helps you identify where things are not what you expected. Okay, You expected something, but what you're observing is something different. And they're the red flags that you've got to, got to be looking for. Okay, so how do we prevent them? Uh, a lot of it is training and practice. Um, Continuing professional development, more working on the job, more experience of certain things, they'll, they'll all keep making you better. That certainly helps. Having the right environment, having an environment that encourages people to make mistakes and you don't get wrapped over the knuckles for it. People say, oh, well, you know, you'll learn next time. Uh, you want to have good supportive environments and employers that will do that as well. Some situations you can set up simulators, and uh, we, we know that that's done a lot in the... Um, aviation and aerospace industry, you know, they would, the astronauts used to test every possible scenario of what could go wrong uh, trying to get to the moon or wherever, just so they knew, you know, in, that, in case that did happen, yep, they tested that, they, they'd had experience of how that could go. A lot of it comes down to design as much as anything. If we can um, just come up with better tools to work with, okay, whether they're electronic tools, physical tools, things that just make it easier for us to pick the right option, uh, make it hard for us to make a mistake, basically. Uh, there's all sorts of uh, check systems as well that can also help uh, us pick the right thing or, or look for what errors we might have as well. There's different ways we can often try and steer people to making the right decision as well, using certain constraints. We certainly do that in transport all the time, trying to direct people to the right part of the road. Uh, and standardization also has a lot to be said for it as well. If we can uh, have things that everyone is familiar with, uh, then we're not trying to uh, use an unfamiliar tool uh, and a greater potential to get it wrong as well.
Okay, so all those things can reduce our errors, but we've got to keep remembering we are human. Okay, and being human, we do make mistakes. We cannot get a perfect system where we won't make some kind of mistake or lapse. And probably our bigger focus then is how do we minimize the consequences of when we still will inevitably make those mistakes. Okay, so we have to allow for that. We have to design for humans being fallible and vulnerable as well. Okay, we get things wrong, and when we get things wrong, we can get seriously hurt as well. Uh, so there's different ways we can do that. We, we want to have backup systems, whether they're human backup systems, someone else checking for us, or an automated system checking for us. We want to have that built in redundancy. Uh, or we want to have systems that prevent us from doing things that are unsafe. Okay, there's a reason why we have safety locks on certain systems so you don't accidentally push a button you shouldn't. Okay, trying to minimize or simplify the environment as well. So trying to do one thing at a time rather than having to juggle three or four at the same time and the chance of getting one of them wrong uh, as well. Uh, perhaps recognizing when we need to give ourselves an extra factor of safety as well because it's a situation that perhaps requires a bit of extra um, protection from the possibility of going wrong as well. Automation has its advantages as well. Certainly it can simplify and get rid of some of those um, uh, human factors. We're seeing a lot at the moment in transport talking about driverless cars, automated vehicles, uh, but we're also seeing suggestions that they're not necessarily the panacea as well. So um, you've got to be a little mindful of where they work in some situations, but not necessarily um, solving all the problems there. And we've got to look for opportunities to try and introduce additional protection as well. So if something does go wrong, we've got either protective equipment or protective barriers or something that is going to minimize the harm if uh, it does go wrong as well. There's lots of options we've got to design these into our systems, basically. OK, I just want to finish up thinking about sort of humans in, in bigger groups as well. Uh, so. We, we usually don't work on our own. We usually work as teams. That's a good thing because we can get the benefit of, of lots of people. Uh, but it, it does mean that then we have the complication of how those groups work together as well. Group dynamics is, is quite a complex thing to understand and, and it's often a reason why things do go wrong. Uh, you can get good results, you can get good productive input from people, but it can also mean that any individuals who say, oh, I've got a bit of an issue with this, they may feel that they're stifled a bit because everyone else is sort of going with the flow as well. And this is the classic thing that we call groupthink. If any of you have ever um, read the story behind uh, the Space Shuttle Challenger um, uh, failure there, basically the decision to launch on what was uh, a fairly cold morning led to the O-ring failures, a lot of that came down to groupthink. Basically a group of very smart, very clever people you'd think to, to understand these issues and yet somehow they decided in the end, no, we're going to launch this uh, over probably the voices of one or two who were who are still quite concerned about the implications of that and obviously it went tragically wrong. So we've got to be careful of, of groups and we've got to recognize uh, that it may happen. Okay, And sometimes it's a case of you think, uh, well, having more many heads is better than one. And uh, so this should be a, a great group. We should be able to do wonderful things. But you've got to be a little careful of that because it can mean that you get too overconfident. Okay, you think you're you're the greatest group. You think you're the right group. You're making the right decision, and that can mean you can take shortcuts. Okay, both in terms of risk and ethical issues as well. And it can mean also that the loudest voices prevail as well. And uh, there's a bit of wanting to be the team. You know, you're either with us or you're against us, and uh, not enough encouraging of dissenting views. Okay, and that's something you've really got to uh, work hard to give everyone the chance to say, are you happy with this? Are there any concerns with this? That's how you, you make groups work well, that you actually do tease those things out as well. Otherwise, you have this very great potential of getting things wrong as a group. This, of course, can extend even broader than that to organizations at large as well, which really are just giant groups or collections of groups there. And there's a lot of things within organizations that can lead to um, real problems that ultimately lead to a safety issue as well. Uh, and that's right from the top down. The top has to lead this. So if you're uh, involved at fairly senior management, then you need to recognize your role and how do you get this right. Okay, How do you lead from the top and encourage people to highlight their concerns and mistakes um, how to uh, review things that could go wrong or have gone wrong uh, and yeah you you want to be looking at those things you want to if people are raising concerns you want to give them a fair hearing as well uh, there's a whole lot of things as organizations uh, that we need to try and do to encourage 
making sure we try and get the right solution in the first place and that it works well, but if not, also working out how do we deal with problems properly as well and we don't sweep them under the carpet, things like that. Okay, so I'm going to leave it for there. So you could do a whole, whole session on, on the human factors alone, but I'm going to pass back to Gordon now to uh, look at the questions of uh, where we go from here. Okay, so in terms of how are we going to manage this risk in projects and our activities? Obviously, we need to know what the risks are, what, who, and how. We need to prioritize the risks, the likelihood versus consequences, and then think about what we can do to manage risks. We're going to avoid that particular activity, we're going to change it, reduce it. Minimise the possibility of it, mitigate it, consequences, transfer responsibility to others, or just do nothing, accept the risk. In terms of how we can go about trying to minimise the chance of creating mistakes and failures, uh, we're trying to create some learning, learning opportunities, and Engineering New Zealand uh, are recording uh, this series so that that will be freely available for all all people to have a look at and i think it's important that it's a long-term access and not just something that's maybe one or two years because i think that learning from mistakes and failures has shown that intergenerational uh, repeating of mistakes and i'm sure there's a lot of information that engineers that preceded me preceded all of us uh, are still relevant today. We need to understand the whole system. We need to understand the actual details around the mistake. But we need to have a good understanding of that whole system. Now, obviously, we can't control a whole lot of it. You know, if the management structure or, or the overall project may be way beyond our scope. But if we're aware of that, we're aware of the potential risks how we can learn to manage that. And in terms of individual mistakes, uh, if we know about the mistakes, understand how it's happened, then of course we obviously need to want to uh, change our own behaviour. So we need to believe that that is advantageous. Now one of the, the tools uh, that's just recently been adopted in New Zealand is the CROSS AUS. Uh, that stands for Confidential Reporting and Structural Safety Australasia. Uh, that's Confidential Reporting, which is based on a UK uh, cross, uh, which has been going for 20 years or so. And the original idea behind that was reporting on a no-blame basis of mistakes by NASA in the actual space program. That's been really successful and just recently uh, launched in New Zealand. New Zealand has just had three representatives of the panel that investigate those uh, uh, complaints, uh, sorry, the uh, confidential reporting. Uh, so expect to see a lot more, uh, as far as the structural engineers are concerned about that, and if you don't already belong to CROSS, it's free. Um, you can go to CROSS-AUS or just simply CROSS uh, and get onto their website, which is being updated in March and will be easier to use. In terms of improving our QA quality assurance. Don't make it too hard. I think we've got to get back to, as Glenn was saying, the fundamentals of what we're trying to do. And if it's structures, and that's my field, try and feel how the structure is going to respond, uh, even just using simple stick drawings. Um, but I think that applies to any system. Do a bit of a sketch um, and try and figure out how it all works and what we're doing, how that fits into the whole um, system. So in terms of um, what we can do to learn better or share our learnings, or share it in our workplace, talk to your colleagues, um, and hopefully there's a culture in your workplace that encourages that. If you're in a small practice, uh, create a discussion group. For example, I belong to two discussion groups, one in the Waikato, one up here in Rodney, 
and we meet either lunch for lunches or morning tea uh, once a month. And we don't have a specific agenda. We just do a random chat about things that are of interest. And it's amazing the learnings uh, that come from that and the common concerns. So you can also share with your technical or special interest group, uh, for example, by um, participating in their activities or writing something for their journal. As I said a few minutes ago, subscribe to CROSS uh, or similar newsletters, and I'm hopeful that similar uh, opportunities will be made available or are available for the other special interest and technical groups. And we want to try and promote a just culture in your workplace CSOC, Engineering New Zealand, or your special interest group, which encourages a no blame reporting of mistakes and incidents. Now, I know this whole business of liability uh, comes into this, and um, I've certainly, over the last few years, have managed to get around this that when you sign a confidentiality agreement uh, for legal proceedings or, or insurance claims, is to put a proviso in there that you can share the learnings that arise from those incidents on an anonymous basis, on the basis that that is, is to promote learning and to avoid or minimize the risk of future mistakes. So the just culture, which is a reasonably new thing, um, aviation industry is promoting it in a fairly big way, and um, the engineer in New Zealand are uh, really keen to try and promote this. So it's trying to create a culture in which frontline operators or others are not publicly punished for their actions, omissions, and decisions taken by them that are in line with their experience and training. Obviously, where gross negligence takes place or willful violations and destructive acts, these are not tolerated. So really, that is it. We're hoping that this is the start for the technical groups to get together and um, promote learning in their particular area. And, and I think that it's important not to think it's just the specialist engineers, the transport engineers, the forensic people, the transport group, uh, mechanical group. Well, I think we'll find that a lot of their learnings are applicable across the whole field, particularly in the systemic type of thing. I think now uh, we're open for questions Thank you very much, uh, Gordon and Glenn, for a really informative presentation this afternoon. It was brilliant. Um, we do have a couple of questions for you. Um, the first one, I think, is, is very interesting. Uh, interested to hear your responses to this, and it is, will my reputation suffer if I share um, a failure? I'll have a go at that one. Um, I think that's probably a really common concern. And the talk that I give to the, I've given to the structural engineers, I start the talk by acknowledging a mistake I made uh, earlier in my career, which led to me being in court, and uh, the court actually found against me. Uh, but there were some really valuable lessons, and I don't believe that if you share it in a appropriate way. Um, that it will. In fact, I believe that it will enhance your standing and reputation. But unless we have a just culture in the workplace, uh, there could be some adverse consequences. So I think the just culture comes first. I can understand people being resident about sharing. With your experience, I just described it took me about 40 years to share it. Thank you, Gordon, and I think that's the very reason uh, why we have established this initiative is to start the conversation and, and make it a nice environment to be able to share those failures and the learnings too. Um, so we've had a couple of requests for your contact details, both Gordon and Glenn. Would you be happy for us to share those uh, following the presentation? Great. So we'll share those along with the recording. Yeah. If anyone has any further questions, please pop them into the Q&A pod. We'll just give it another minute or so. Brent, so while we're waiting for questions, I'll just expand on the, um, the comment that uh, Gordon just made before. I, I think certainly there's a, perhaps a difference in terms of where you are in your career, whether you're fairly early on, perhaps still aspiring, climbing up the ladder, 
and perhaps towards the end of the career when when you're perhaps more comfortable about able to reflect on some of those things in the past and um, you know that is certainly a, a personal issue people going to have to face the other thing I guess is thinking about the audience as Gordon, Gordon said uh, and it might be that within companies within organizations that's a good starting point that if within groups in companies you can have quite honest chats and say oh we didn't get that right and how do we fix that better you may be comfortable doing that before you sort of step out and, and go to a, perhaps a wider forum uh, within the industry as well. Um, so, you know, baby steps. We've got to acknowledge these uh, issues going through. Confidentiality might be another reason why some things you, you're a bit hesitant about how much you can say in the public arena. That's that's definitely an issue that we've had a few people ask us about is um, how, do we, how do we deal with that and, and perhaps making case studies, for example. Thank you, Glenn. Uh, we have another couple of questions here. What is uh, your feedback for a project if the design engineer is not the construction monitoring engineer, especially if there's question marks on consented design work? Perhaps a question for Gordon. I learned from the failure I spoke about um, eight years after I commenced practice. Um, ever since I've insisted on being engaged to carry out construction monitoring, I've made it a condition of my, well, they were the in-design certificates and now they're PS1s. And if a client's not prepared uh, to agree to that, uh, I decline the commission. Now that may be because I'm at the, the end of my uh, career or heading towards it. Um, that's easier for me, but I've been doing that for you know, for the best part of 40 years and a bit of kickback. But in general, if you explain the situation, uh, most clients will understand it. Um, they might begrudge the extra money, but uh, if it's on the basis that they're going to get a better job, a more reliable job, uh, it can be sold. And I've certainly managed to do that probably 90% of the time. Thank you, Gordon. Um, under today's com uh, competitive commercial models for investigation, design and supervision, arguably design rigour and sufficient supervision input is always going to be compromised by fee limits. How do you suggest this potentially uh, fatal flaw in the commercial model and its associated risks is best managed? That's a very, very difficult one. I think uh, a lot of minds that are probably right of the mine uh, have addressed that issue without coming up uh, with a, a solution because sadly too many people um, do uh, compete on fees uh, on the commercial model and uh, a number of clients are not really informed enough to realise that what they should be looking for is quality, not just in the short term design but in the overall project. Uh, I think some government departments uh, uh, doing that, Glenn may be in a better space than me to answer that, uh, but I think you've just got to say there's a point which you won't go below. Yeah, I mean we um, definitely find the difference in some clients who sort of I guess appreciate the, the time and quality of, of what we're providing versus you know who, who can provide the lowest cost when we, we can, if we lose it we sit there thinking how on earth is someone else delivering this for less? Uh, and you feel like there was probably some corners cut somewhere. Um, so it's, yeah, it is partly that, dare I say, education of clients, and, and that might be something better done as an industry rather than um, perhaps individual companies as well. Uh, there's always the accusations, I guess, of self-interest. We just want more money. But uh, I think we need to identify um, or explain to clients the importance of it, you know, and perhaps pointing out from some of the examples where things have gone wrong. Maybe this is where, as we build more case studies, we can point out some of those systemic failures and hopefully then some of the clients will be able to see it and go, ah, okay, I better make sure we don't do that as well. So there's a request here for a link to Cross Oz. We have put a link in the Q&A uh, box there, which you should be able to see, but we'll also circulate the link in the follow-up with the recording. Another question here, um, there seems to be a conflict at time where ability to share lessons learned is prohibited as a result of perhaps a confidential insurance issue or other settlement and how do we get around uh, 
Um, we've yeah, we've had this question from a couple, and I guess there's a few different ways we can we can look at it. Uh, one of them probably is just over time. We if we look at things that have happened going back a few decades, it's usually a lot easier to sort of reflect on those and uh, take the lessons from those. Um, that the key players may have moved on by that point and so forth. So I guess as much as possible, we look for things that perhaps aren't from the recent past if they're still sensitive. The other thing is just how much we can uh, anonymize situations as well. So if we're developing case studies, how much can we make them generic? You know, City A, a building in City A had this happen to them or whatever, to perhaps try and get across the key lesson, which is probably not to point a finger at someone, but to say actually there was a systematic issue that, that caused this problem. And that's what the, the takeaway lesson is we want you to, um, to have, not that such and such consultant's a terrible person. Uh, so it, it doesn't mean it's easy in every case, but uh, I guess we'll see as we um, have some of these technical groups developing. We've got um, quite a final specific question here from a student um, who is building a bridge as part of their um, study and they've asked what errors should they be careful of? Well, I think um, you've covered a number of considerations in your presentation today um, and perhaps uh, a more detailed answer could, um, could take place in a follow-up. Gordon, I think you're on mute there. Hi, hello. Oh, Gordon, I... So simple. Um, so make sure you got your loads right. You've got your load paths right. You've got the foundations and the geotechnical conditions right. And if it's a bridge over a waterway, you've got your water course and hydraulics done right. I, I always enjoyed uh, watching the, the bridge breaking competitions at Canterbury every year and, and seeing the interesting designs people come up with. And I suppose it's a, it's a good example of learning from the failures of others because you soon understood certain designs seem to work quite well or too well sometimes um, versus other ones as well. A lot of industries we can't do that, we can't fail fast, we can't try something, oh it broke, try again, oh it broke and so forth. But if you have the opportunity to do that, to do sort of prototypes Well, I think that concludes um, the session for today. Thank you very much, Glenn and Gordon, for your presentation. And we'll look forward to hearing a bit more from you in the new year, um, followed on by our technical groups. Um, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Keep a look out in your Engineering New Zealand news, your technical group uh, news and branch information. We will share with you um, as soon as we have some new dates confirmed.